Hey everyone, today's species spotlight is on one of the most uncommon and unusual species of snakes we have here in the herpetological keeping community, and that is the Calabar burrowing python, or is it boa? It gets a little bit tricky. Now real quick, every animal you see in the video today that's actually a video footage does come from our good friends Braden Exotics, who was kind enough to show and present their really cool and uncommon species of snakes like they've done in many species here if you want to check out this playlist for our Speedly Species Spotlight videos. If you want to check that out, please go check that out. It really helps me out a lot. Now, the Calabar Burrowing Python, or boa, is a really, really unusual three-foot-long boid species of snake. And it is very unlike many other species that even closely resemble it. And I'll go into exactly what that is. So, this thing has been mostly called the Calabar Burrowing Python, which makes sense considering it lays eggs. And so it's been called a python for years and years and years. But recently we've really started to call them a boa for a couple other different reasons. When we look at them, they look very similar to that of say the sand boas, like the Kenyan sand boa or the Russian sand boa. And they were even grouped together in their same genus for a little while, but they are significantly different from them and from pythons that lay eggs. So there's a whole thing that has to do with different species and subspecies. Scientists generally talk about three different things that make them separate enough to be a species or subspecies. The first of which is morphological, which means what it physically looks like that differentiates, that differentiates it from other things. The second is geographical, which means it's far enough away or separated enough between populations to determine that separation. And the third of which is DNA. So when we very first look at the Calabar Boring Python, let's start with the geographical first. Most of the sand bows that we think of come from more arid regions, Kenya, Sahara, parts of the Middle East where the Russian sand boas come from. The Calabar Boring Python comes from Central Africa and more rainforest and jungle habitats from countries like Gabon, Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and even a little bit of Angola. So a much different habitat. And so instead of going through sandy, rocky soil that we would typically think of for a fossorial boa, the Calabar Boring Python slash boa actually spends most of its time digging through loose, humid, and moist dirt and soil and lots of leaf litter. So very different in that aspect. Morphologically, it looks very, very different than a lot of the sand boas. Yes, it does have more of a blunted round head and small eyes and small nostrils, typical of an animal living underground, but it looks very, very, very different. And I'm gonna get into more specifics about that in just a second. The third of which is the DNA part. They have found that they are actually entirely unrelated from any other species of boa or python. They're more closely related to boas despite laying eggs, so that's why they're oftentimes called burrowing boas rather than pythons, but they are in their own family, which I will mispronounce as always, so it's right here. That's its own genus, the only one that the Calabar python belongs to. Now, let's talk about morphologically or what it looks like. So as we said, round head, little eyes, and small nostrils. But when you look at it, it looks very different. Most sand boas, you can still see an obvious taper tail. The Calabar burrowing python, boa, has a very round, blunted, stubby tail that looks very close to identical of that of the head, and that has to do with defense. So, even though it does live in the ground and will occasionally come up for food and things like that, if a predator does come across the boa python, it will actually ball up like a royal or a ball python will. However, when it buries its head, it oftentimes will expose its tail, the big nubby little part of its tail, as kind of a, and then wriggle it around a little bit to hopefully kind of say, hey, this is the head, don't eat me, go for the tail, before they can hopefully try to get away so it doesn't immediately go for the head. In addition, they will also musk if they are feeling threatened or anything like that, like a lot of other pythons uh, and snakes will as well. And then they're also really different, not only from the other boas and pythons, but really most squamids in general, by the way, squamids is the group that categorizes snakes and lizards. So if you look at the whole like genealogy tree, it's squamids, snakes, lizards, and then tuataras over there. But that's what that is. And so why that is, is that they actually lack palatal teeth. So your palate is the roof of your mouth, a lot of lizards and boas, and here is a really cool and hopefully pretty clear example of what that is, albeit this is from a lizard, 
they have an interior secondary row of teeth, which most people believe has to do with holding and gripping onto food. So if you ever see a snake open up its mouth or sometimes a lizard like an iguana or something like that, you will see that secondary row of teeth inside. Not usually with a whole lot of different venomous species, but they do exist in there. But the Calabar Boring Python lacks those teeth in general. Now, this thing is just a really cool and very interesting species of snake. So as we said, its defense mechanism is to ball up, show its butt, and then musk a little bit, which means in captivity, when you're handling this animal, it's pretty reluctant to bite. And so that makes it a fairly handleable animal. It's not gonna move around a whole lot on you. However, it really doesn't enjoy being handled. However, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily a bad captive. So now we're gonna talk about the captive part of this, right? So almost every single Calabar Boring Python that you find, if you can find them, they are very uncommon. Even most specialty stores don't have them very often. Those are ones that you're usually gonna find at the larger reptile expos and events. However, if you do have a good relationship with one of your you know, brick and mortar reptile stores, you might be able to ask them to bring one in for you. However, every single one will be a wild import. Very, very few people around the world have ever been able to produce these guys. So you are dealing with a wild pet animal that we've talked about in extents about why that isn't necessarily the best option for a lot of different people. However, they do actually make pretty good captives. Number one is they get right onto rodents fairly quickly. And that is because in the wild, their diet does primarily consist of small rodents and mammals like shrews or even some ground nesting birds. So usually they can get right onto our regular staple diet of mice and rats. Then they also need a pretty deep layer of substrate as a fossorial snake species. They need lots of deep, like you would a Kenyan Samboa. However, again, they come from the more rainforest jungly habitats. So multiple layers are always recommended of like leaf litter, sphagnum moss, nice moist soil, maybe even a little bit of subfloor to allow lots of humidity to be able to go. Um, it is a little unclear whether or not they are truly crepuscular or not in their wild ranges. However, any species outside of, you know, deep subterranean and cave troglites do benefit from ultraviolet light, UVA and UVB. So maybe a little bit of low level UVA B for them would always be good. Now this animal, just because it does live underground does not mean that it won't actually come up. So something like the large half logs or big cork tubes, you may actually see them get into and onto those items. So, hey, why not throw one in there? They're not very large, so you don't need a huge, huge area. However, still a three foot snake, so you're gonna need something with a decent, you know, footprint for them to move around on. They don't need to be kept very warm, not even as warm as like a ball python or even a Kenyan Samboa, the more popular one that I'm gonna keep referencing. So they do usually make a pretty decent captive. However, this is one that I wouldn't necessarily say you're gonna be taking out all the time if you're looking for a handleable interactive pet, but if you're looking for a very uncommon and unusual species to keep that will probably do very well in captivity, even being wild caught, maybe this is something that you could look into. It's kind of unknown about the total number of wild animals out there, so they're not really listed anywhere under CITES or even threatened or anything like that by any of the different organizations that would attest to those things. And then a final really quick fun fact about the burrowing python, boa, that is really interesting. So, remember when we talked about the defense, about how they kind of fall up and do things like that? Well, there's actually one more thing that they have that might have to do with defense, and that has to do with their scales. The Calabar Boring Python boa has the hardest, or some of the hardest, scales of any snake species in the world. And scientists think that it may not have to do, well, let me rephrase, some scientists think that it may not have to do necessarily with the fence of a predator coming at them, but it may actually have to do with their hunting strategy. So the Calabar Boring Python often will predate, again, those small mammals and, and ground nesting birds where they go into underground or nesting burrows and nests, on the ground, I should say, and then they will usually go for smaller ones, infants, babies, and hatchling birds. And then they'll usually either constrict, eat whole, or just kind of use the walls of the burrow to kind of help incapacitate their prey. They don't always eat the adults in the burrows or the nests. And as we all know from keeping animals, a cornered rodent, a cornered rat will bite, and that can inflict a very, very dangerous wound on a predator, even a snake. 
So if you are going into these little burrows with not a whole lot of room and making a mama, mouse, rat, or shrew really angry by eating their babies, you're going to need a pretty tough hide to deal with those bites, right? Through lab testing, they actually found that the Calabar burrowing python scales are more than 10 times harder than the next species or any of the other species of snake scales that they did in fact test. So pretty cool, right? Hopefully you guys enjoyed today's video. Thank you so much for watching. Again, if you can check out the other species spotlight playlist, here it is. You can go check that out. Thank you again, Brighton Exotics, for allowing us to videotape some of your really cool and amazing animals. And if you guys want to check out more of those oddball species, which more than likely, if you're watching this, you probably have. But hey, there you go. Check out again. We still have a few more species of theirs coming out. We're always looking for other ones to get into as well. Thank you again so much. Please like and subscribe. Hit the bell notification. Questions, comments, concerns. Let me know down in the description of the video. You can always email me if you want to support me more than just watching this. So I have my Patreon, all of that mumbo jumbo. Again, thank you so much. Hope you're having a great day and we will check you next time.